Welcome to our Home Runs for Parents. This is session two of five. We're glad to have you today. And just a quick reminder, every session will be loaded onto Facebook or YouTube for the county. And if you didn't get to watch a session, you can always go back. So today we're in session two of five. You can definitely watch session, session one and catch up on all the great parenting tips that we had. So if you're new or you forgot who we all are, I wanted to have a quick introduction so you knew who your educators were today. We all are parents or and grandparents, so we come with a lot of personal experience. Um, our professional experience, though, will be on parenting tips and strategies for all parents, grandparents, anyone that are, are raising children. So let's do quick introductions. My name is Sarah Kite, and I work with UT Extension in McMinn County. Lisa? My name is Lisa McMahon, and I work with the UT Extension in Roan County. Karen Nelms. I'm in Jefferson County and I work with you. And we have Connie Griner. Hi, Connie Griner. And I'm here in Campbell County and I work for the University of Tennessee Extension Office as an FCS agent or 4-H agent. And Sarah. I'm Sarah Vaden from Jefferson County and I do the Family and Consumer Science Program. And Heather. I'm Heather Kyle Harmon, and I work uh, in Knox County with Adult FCS Program. Thank you all, and we're excited to have other parents joining us today. So session two is all about team sportsmanship. And we love the analogy that this program uses on the sports team. If you've all ever played a sport, it's good to have a great coach and a great team. So this is a little overview of today. It's team sportsmanship, which refer to the sportsmanship between you and your children. We're gonna go through scoring runs and receiving penalties and how that works out in the family, rewards and consequences, how to ace conflict, some game day coaching strategies and tips, and also a few activities. One thing I like about today's session is that it talks about the pregame, the game day, and the postgame. And just like a sports team, if you go up to your game day and you're not prepared because you didn't have pregame practice and learn skills, sometimes your game day doesn't go so well. And then you have postgame, which we talk about what didn't go so well in making plans. And sometimes in families, we always hit home runs. And sometimes we always strike out or we have a third base hitting a triple. So we don't always have the same game day. It's always different and it's good to know what's going on and how to improve our games. So sportsmanship. So we're gonna talk about your trust and your respect within families and your children. So you might have multiple children and one kid loves and trusts, respects you. And for some reason, the other relationship with another child's not working out so well. So how do we handle those things? Um, our first section that we had, we talked about the RAM, which is the relationship attachment model, which is this grand picture that this whole program relies on. It's a foundation of this program as to your major connections and relationships with your kids. So it's a great, great tool that we can use. And it's important to know our connections. How do we connect to each other? How do we connect to our kids? And the RAM is that picture. And then we talked about it's normal for families parent and child relationships to get out of balance. It's completely normal, but the important thing is to work at keeping that connection, to keep improving that connection. And we refer to um, first base, second base, third base, and home, and how sometimes you get a single or a triple or a double, and you kind of change in your relationships from day to day or week to week. And so it's important to know how you're doing and what areas you want to improve on to keep enhancing your relationship and your bond with your kids. And so we talked about the first connection area, which is staying in the know, having those team talks, talking to your kids. How do you talk to your kids? What do you say to your kids? And there are a couple of handouts that we attached that were questions that you can ask your kids, questions your kids can ask you because the relationship goes both ways. We want our kids to want to know about us as parents as we wanna know about our kids. So, Today, we're gonna to go into trust and respect. I want my kids to trust me and respect me, and I wanna be able to trust and respect my kids. And that's your team sportsmanship, working together. But what happens when your trust is broken? What happens if that respect is broken? How do you build that back up? 
So before we dig into the, the tips and the strategies, we're going to talk about trust. What is trust? How would you define trust to your child? So I looked it up in the dictionary and it says that trust is this confidence or belief in another, which also refers to the integrity, the strength, the reliability, the trustworthiness. Um, so it's this feeling of confidence that comes from opinion or attitude of general respect for each other. So what you know develops your trust of somebody. So these produce your also feelings of mistrust. Sometimes based on what someone does or says, you might then not have trust for the person. So how do you gain trust of your, your child? You know, how does that work out? And it's specific in this class of how you want to look at those things. So we're going to work on a game plan for trust and building trust with you and your child. So trust and respect go together. If you trust somebody, you also respect them. If you respect someone, you trust them. You're also um, credible, means you're doing your job well. You say what you do. You have this great high character. You're consistent with your values in your family. <clears throat> you believe what you are doing. So thinking about how you handle rules in your home and discipline in your home, correction, teaching, do you act responsibly as a parent, as a coach towards your kids? Do they reciprocate that respect? So you're working at building this trust and respect. It's also compared to the sportsmanship of team where you want to be part of this team. If you have a coach who is disrespectful, you can't trust, you don't want to be part of that team. You want to exit that team and find somebody else. And same thing with your, your sports team, sportsmanship in your family. You, your kids, they want a parent who's going to be trustworthy and respectful. They want to be led by this person. And as I was reading through this lesson today, I was reminded of this quote that someone passed on to me when I became a new parent. My kids are six and seven now, um, but before they were born, they reminded me to always be a consistent parent, do the right thing no matter what. And they told me that children want to be led by parents, but insist parents earn the right to lead them. Just like a coach, I want a coach that is full of integrity, doing the right thing no matter what, has my best interest, and then I want to be led by that person. And just relate that back to parenting. You know, kids want you to lead them, but they want you to be a trustworthy, respectful parent towards them. So <clears throat> when you and your children genuinely trust each other, you hold this positive attitude of respect. And who doesn't want to be respected by their kids? You know, it's, so, it's just so foundational, but sometimes we forget these simple things. So it's ultimately a way to develop these feelings of trust, trust and respect. And there's three things that go into building this great trust and respect, the sportsmanship. And that includes the values you live by and then you instill in your children. The second is structure of how you establish these rules, responsibilities, and expectations, and also rewards and consequences. And the third one is just strategies. How do you Use these to handle the conflicts and discipline. So all three of those go together to build that trust and respect, the values, the structure, and the strategies. And we're going to break those down in detail. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. We're going to break it down together. But first, I want to ask you the question here on the screen. How does a coach build a strong, build a strong trust and respect among its team members? You know, how do coaches do that? I want to do it. My intentions are there. But what's the how-to? You know, sometimes we need the how-to. If I haven't had a family unit that I had trust in and respect, it's hard for me as a parent now to know what to do. I need to know the how-to. This, this parent playbook, which is all about what this class is for, this is your playbook for parenting. Take from it what you need to build your skills. So a few things um, that it came up with would be to verbally compliment your players for their strengths to respect your players, to encourage players to work together, you know, encourage your kids to work together with each other, resolve conflicts and misunderstandings between players, between player and coach. So if misunderstanding happens, you tackle it, you work through it together. Um, the coach is fair with rules and expectations. And that goes back to what is your age and stage of your child? You know, what are you expecting from those kids? Um, the coach is also knowledgeable teaching these skills to help your kids improve, practicing self-control when angry. Have you ever seen an angry coach just fly off the handle and you're just watching this train wreck wondering, 
whoa, <laughs> who wants to be a player for that person? You know, and that goes back to parents having that self-control when you're angry and your kids will mirror how you handle yourself. So it's important to have that self-control. And that's a balancing. We always are work towards, working towards balancing in our self-control. Coaches apologize when they're wrong or inappropriate. Coaches are consistent and they also fulfill their promises. If you say it, you need to do it. So how does that work with your children? You know, same thing. If I want, if my child wants to be trusted and respected by me, they do the same things that I would do for them. It's the same thing. So let's make a game plan. So if you have a sheet of paper, have something nearby, um, thinking about your game plan, we're gonna break this into three areas and this is your actual plan. I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but I'm gonna tell you the three areas and I want you just to think and brainstorm and make a plan that works best for you and your family. Um, so this helps with developing this good, healthy relationship with your children or your child that promotes this healthy trust and respect, that sportsmanship of your, your family unit. So we're gonna talk about your personal values, which is your why, the structure, which is your what, the strategies, which is your how. So your rules and expectations reflect your values and the ways that you model your values. So thinking about those. So write down on your sheet of paper, values, structures, and strategies. So your values, thinking about what do you believe the most? What is your moral compass? This is an extensive list. It can go on for pages. You know, it's not just one value. Thinking about what are all of your values? And then I want you to think about your structures. That's all your rules and expectations. I don't want my kids to get hit by a car. So the structure is the rule or expectation of you stay in the yard. You don't go play in the street. If something like a ball goes in the street, you come find me and we'll make sure the street's clear before I proceed to get it. So thinking about the structures that are in place to help the values happen. Then the third one is the ways that you can act consistently with the values that you want still. Sometimes, you know, that's your, your strategy, which is your how. Do you role model this? Do they already know what to do? You know, this is your how. I'm also gonna attach a handout called values to instill in your children, which will help you generate more ideas. Sometimes when you talk about values, you think about, um, I think about honesty, that's the first one that comes to my mind. You might think of one and then you're just stuck. So to help you brainstorm, um, there'll be a handout that I'll attach to the end of this presentation. And there's tons of values in there and you can choose which ones might be yours. It'll generate ideas of other values that aren't on the sheet. Um, so an example of how you do this activity, just write down your why, your what, and your how. So for example, mine that comes to mind is um, honesty. That's my why, my value is honesty. So the what is my rule expectation. I expect my kids to always tell the truth no matter what. And when kids are little, it's always somebody else's fault. And I don't want my kids to become 30 year olds and still have that mentality. It's not gonna help in relationships if it's always somebody else's fault. So it's a big value that I, I hold them to it. And so even bystander truth is you know, part of this one. So the consequence, um, if they choose not to do this, if they lie about school behavior or um, grades, then they might have to lose some privileges as far as um, extracurricular activities if they're involved in a, a sport or just lose any screen time, which is, you know, all the screens. So if you cannot follow this rule, that's your, your consequence. Or they're little, they like to snatch. One of mine are in kindergarten, they like to snatch, take things without asking. Um, and so in our household, treats are our treat, a yeah, privilege, they don't happen every day. So if they cannot follow the rules and be honest about their snatching and, you know, taking things without asking, then they will lose their treats for a X amount of time, depending on, you know, the crime. The crime and the time go together. I also thought about another value for myself um, and our family is this unconditional love. No matter what someone does or says, after we work it out and apologize, we still love each other no matter what. I don't like what you did or said, but I still love you. 
Um, there's a difference between what you say and do and you. You're not horrible. What you said is horrible. So the why, the value is apologizing. The what, the rule expectation is to find the time to work out and sit down, work out the problem, to talk through it. And as the coach, the parent, <clears throat> my kids don't know what to do. So I have to help them speak, have to give them ideas of what they could say. We use I messages where you say how you feel, what happened and what you want to be done differently. So my child might say, I'm so mad at you because you took my Legos. I was creating that and you took my Legos. The last piece I needed is in your hands. I need you to ask you before you take it. <clears throat> and then the other child would be like, oh, okay. You know, they didn't think about that. In the moment, all I thought about is I need that Lego and I don't care about anybody else because I'm not thinking about anybody else, you know? So how do they work through and talk through it? And that's how you do it. So the how, the strategy as a parent would be just paying attention and helping them to know what to do or say. Um, and then after they practice that, you know, maybe they get become 12 year olds, then I'll quiz them, you know, and say, like, what do you do about this? What do you say and kind of prompt them? So that's kind of how that activity works. Um, if you parent with anybody else, um, it's a really good activity to do together. So every household, every place they go is um, having the same game plan to help these kids grow. So you have your values, your why, your structure, your what, your strategies, your how. And this whole session, we're going to go through this to help you even further. Um, and we're going to have Connie talk next about the pregame, the game day, and postgame, which puts more of this into your game plan. And like Sarah said, in this section, we're going to talk about the strategies called the pregame, the game day, and the postgame. And I think a lot this these three things can definitely promote trust and respect among uh, your children. But before we define our relationship strategies, we want to suggest some helpful framework um, for understanding when to implement these strategies for the pregame meetings, the game day to implement, excuse me, the game day and the postgame follow-up. So to break this down, let's say the game is going to represent some conflictual or corrective situation with your kids. Then the pregame is how we talk about the situation or even before it happens. And then the postgame is how we discuss it afterwards. And the game day is the time when the situation is actually happening. So in step one, um, I like for us to think of a professional sports championship game, like the Super Bowl. Let's think about how many hours is the actual pregame show? It's usually hours longer than the game, and then the post-game show can go on for days, actually. So let's think about a coach as a parent and what he or she does with their team. The hours they spend working with the team, the pregame and practices, the team meetings, the workouts, is so much longer than the team, um, the time actually in the game. And in the post game, the coach reviews the tapes, analyzes what time, uh, excuse me, analyzes what needs to be worked on in the upcoming pregame practices. So this is a great way of thinking about, you know, we need thinking about what needs to be worked on in those upcoming pregame practices and how we're going to deal with conflicts and corrective disciplinary situations with our kids. We need to know how to coach them with skill during the game, but the real coaching takes place in the pregame and the post games with our kids. So a lot of parents go from one game to the next without any pre or post game meetings with their kids in which they review and rehash the game. So this type of approach can uh, disregard the effective strategies to, of the follow up and because what's done in the post game and and it overlaps with the pregame meeting with uh, another upcoming event or another game, the strategy of follow-up becomes preventative for that next situation. So the following steps on relationship structures and relationship strategies can be used in three periods of the pregame talk. So before conflict or the challenge that you're having with the kids, the actual game day, which is during the, the conflict or the challenge that's happening, right then and there, and then the post game. So after a conflict or a challenge. So step two is gonna define our relationship structures. 
So there's two, area, two areas that we will cover in this topic of defining our relationship structures. If you're not familiar with the idea, then uh, let's think of a job. The structure of someone's job consists of two basic areas, their job description, and then your salary, and hopefully you'll get benefits with your plan. So a job description includes the person's responsibilities, the expectations of management, the, the tasks that we were required to fulfill and the skills needed to accomplish these tasks. And then there's the pay structure, which includes hourly pay or salary, any bonuses, and also the potential consequences for not doing their job. Um, so in a similar way, the structure of our relationship with our child or children includes our expectations and rules, our child's responsibilities and the needed skills that our child or our, or our kids should develop. And like a job, there are rewards for when your child does things well and consequences for not following the rules. And these two basic areas provide the structure of the, our, the relationship between you two or three or how many children you do have. <laughs> And they give that relationship a definition and help to define the content of the boundaries with your kids, expectations with your kids and outcomes. So very important, all of these things can definitely help with the trust and the relationship you have with each other when you do these, break it down into these three types of steps. So in our next session, Lisa is going to tell us about four areas that can give our children a sense of structure in their life. Okay, so we're going to talk about lend me your ears. So if you think back to um, your high school days when you were studying William Shakespeare. So Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar, he had a poignant speech that he um, used to get everyone's attention. And he said, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. So what do you think that means when somebody says, lend me your ears? That is our call to pay attention, right? Our ears need to perk up. And this is the moment when we all need to really lean in and focus on what is being said and told because it is important. So ears, that's many things that we talk about. We have an acronym. So our acronym for ears is the E is expectations. A is the assignments. R is the rules. And S is the skills. So when we're talking with our children and we ask them to for them to lend us our ears. We have a lot of important things that we want to grasp and them hold on to. So in that event um, and being part of a sports theme, you have a stat sheet that will be at the end of the recording. You'll be able to access this and download it or print it off. And you have a stat sheet for each child. So your stat sheet would be your sportsman sheet with your name on it and how you did throughout the game. So on our um, stat sheet, we're going to talk about the ears. And um, let's see. So this is uh, four areas that we want our children to pay attention to, not just when we're discussing it, but throughout their, their day and their childhood so that they grow up and be good little humans, right? So it's important that you and your child have an understanding of what the areas on their stat sheet are that you want them to focus on and pay close attention to. So in the expectations, assignments, rules, and skills, it is also important that you have your child involved in this area. Um, it, it's not very fair as me as a parent to my daughter to set guidelines for her. And number one, she might not know what they are. I have these expectations for her, but if I don't tell her what the expectations are, then she can't really step up to the plate and do what she needs to do to fulfill these expectations. Um, so it is important that she be involved in this whole entire situation. Um, when your child knows that you listen and you value their input, then they take ownership of the whole process 
um, as behaving well or fulfilling roles in the family. They take ownership to that and more pride in that. And then they are more willing to be, um, uh, to do their part. So you can be their biggest cheerleader and their coach and not just um, upset or disappointed. If they don't know, then they can't do it, right? And lots of children need reasoning of why you need to do this. So when you take your stat sheet, you'll take a sheet for each child. So I have one daughter, her name is Emma. I would write her name at the top of her stat sheet. And then on the stat sheet, um, <clears throat> it says characteristics of your child's development stages. So my daughter is a young adult. So, uh, well, she's an adult now. So I have even though she is an adult, she's still my child and I have expectations for her. So while we are um, uh, still in my little portion of raising her, I have some expectations that I want for her life. So that's some characteristics that I would put into her stat sheet now. When she was younger, I might would detail them a little bit more age appropriately and getting her ready for uh, the workforce or whatnot, uh, whatever characteristic I felt we needed to really pour into then. And then next on the stat sheet is um, my expectations to be fulfilled. Those would be things that I want to her to grab hold of, um, an assignment or a job that could be chores or different responsibilities that she has in the household, um, rules to be followed. As Sarah mentioned, she doesn't want her children to be ran over by a truck. So she had the rule of you play into the yard. And then she would expound on why she doesn't want them to leave the yard because you could get hit by a truck. <laughs> Um, just things to keep our children healthy and safe. And then skills to be developed is the last one. And that would be things that I would want my child to, um, I want you to get a job and I want you to pay your bills, not just not end it there. I want you to get a job. I want you to pay your bills. Why do I want you to get a job? Because you will, um, you have responsibilities as you get older and you want to know that you can manage those responsibilities yourself. So you can give back to other people who've given to you. So she has a, a reason of why these expectations are set forward for her. And then the skills that she would be developing, um, for instance, in going to work on her own, would be able to take care of herself. And then at the bottom of your stat sheet is uh, tier one, two, and three, and it's listed in consequences and rewards. So of course, with every um, child, you would have their own particular stat sheet because each age and each child has a different variety of information that they could understand. And so it would make it more elementary for a young child. If you take your sister's toy, then um, the first consequence might be a warning. The second one may be time out. The third one may be you lose your toy for X amount of time. As the child ages, you would uh, create those to different degrees of what the, the consequence should be. But also, whenever there's a consequence, there also should be a reward. If there was an event that could make a child have a consequence that they have to lose something from, then if they did it uh, correctly or lived up to your expectations, then that should be rewarded also. So you could list the different rewards. If you make, uh, if you study really hard this semester, then, and you make a B average or better, you know, whatever your expectation is for your child, then you could reward them with praise. You could reward them with dinner out. You could reward them with extra screen time. It's whatever you develop for your child for each stat sheet, but do make sure that each one of your children has their own stat sheet because we are all uh, created differently. Um, so with both consequences and rewards, you should think of three, lev uh, three levels, minor, moderate, and serious. So of course, um, the first would be a warning or a praise, and then you would move forward from there. So there are three more effective alternatives, or there are more many effective alternatives different in physical discipline, 
um, that should be something that definitely should be considered. Um, this day and age, as Sarah also mentioned, kids are very into their screens, anything that has a screen. And that's oftentimes more effective to just take something like that from uh, for an amount of time than any sort of physical discipline that we could do. So a little food for thought there. And I'm gonna pass it on to Heather. All right, so um, step three in our game plan is gonna be defining your relationship strategies. So the last step in our game plan involves defining and mastering relationship strategies in dealing with our children, especially during conflict. So the biggest thing to remember about this is our children do, so, do more so what we do than what we say. So modeling appropriate behavior during conflict, um, they call it in the heat of the game, is so important. So respect is a two-way street. We have to show respect um, even in the heat of the game, even in disciplining our children, um, and then that will be returned to us. So, um, you know, there are many challenges a parent faces when confronted with conflict with their kids. So you can think of these challenges as your competitors who want you to lose it in the heat of the game. Um, and that ends up hurting all the parties involved. So I thought of a, a situation, um, so my son plays basketball, and we were in a very heated, close game, and there was a bad call that was called, and the other coach lost it. Um, and so because of this, our team ended up getting to shoot 12 technical free throws, and 11 of them were made. So our team scored an extra 11 points because the coach lost it. But also the after effects from that were loss of respect from the players, loss of respect from the parents. Um, just the, it was the atmosphere in the gym was just, it was crazy. So, um, you know, making sure that even in the heat of a conflict, we are keeping our cool. So it's very important that you consider both your approach and your attitude. So, you know, there's really no perfect time for approaching our child. Um, however, it's wise to consider ways to respectfully approach your child with issues and concerns. Um, you know, it's really all about the approach. Um, and like we said, respect is a two-way street. So if we were sitting there watching TV and we're in the middle of our show and our child walks up and grabs the remote and turns the TV off, we would not be very happy. But we as parents sometimes tend to do that because we're ready to have a conversation and we're going to have it right now. Um, but that's not showing respect. That's not that two-way street. So modeling respectful attitudes and situations, um, you know, are really important that we're modeling that. And also gauging kind of our children's attitude and mood, you know, hitting things at the right time is very important. Um, you know, right in the middle of a conflict is not the time to talk about other conflicts or if they're already in a bad mood or, you know, all those kinds of things. So we're going to think about some situations um, and when is a good time to talk to our kids and when is not such a great time. So, you know, if we approach our child when they're very busy, um, you know, if they're in the middle of a game or they're in the middle of a show or they're in the middle of talking to their friends, it's better to wait until um, our child is more relaxed. They're not in the middle of something. And we, as the parent, can even say, hey, uh, wrap that up in about five minutes. I need to talk to you. So just giving them a warning, giving them time to finish what they're doing, because we would want that same respect given to us. In the middle of a fight, like we said, um, you know, approaching times that are enjoyable and positive um, and not when there's already conflict going on just before something. So if you're walking out the door going to church or school or wherever, not really the great time to bring up really hard conversations or to do any type of disciplining. Um, don't ignore the timing and the mood. You know, if they have already come in, they've had a really long, hard day. You know, I think about, um, you know, during um, TCAP testing or finals week, not a real great time to have really serious conversations with our kids. They're already so distracted and overwhelmed. Um, so saying, starting off conversations with, you are so stupid, or you never think before you 
that's not real great um, ways to, to lead into a conversation. Remember, the approach is everything. Um, I can't handle any more of your whatever. Um, and then I know you're busy, but so that's pretty much saying, I know you're in the middle of something, but I'm going to interrupt anyway. So, you know, if, the, if we give them that five minute warning or 10 minute warning, hey, can you wrap up and, and we're going to um, have a conversation or can I talk to you when you're done? So remembering that approach is very important. The next step is being able to apologize um, in a meaningful way and teaching our children to apologize in meaningful ways. This is so important. So sometimes we do have to step back as parents and um, say, oh, you know what? I handled that wrong. Um, so making sure that we are willing to apologize um, with when we have had out of control emotions or bad attitudes. Modeling these meaningful apologies usually strengthens your role as a parent and improves your relationship. So making sure that we use the word, I'm sorry, I apologize, and describe what you think you did or said that was wrong. So what are you sorry for? And then making sure that we talk about how it impacted another person. So this is that modeling behavior that we really need. We want our children to learn because we want to make sure that they can apologize and being able to put themselves in another person's shoes. This is how my bad behavior or my bad attitude affected another person. So we're basically teaching that to our kids. And then meaningful apologies um, facilitate that forgiveness. So a lot of times it's good closure to that conversation when we say, I forgive you, or I accept your apology. You're just recognizing that person, um, their words, their sincerity, they told you what they're sorry for, how it impacted you, and then you're forgiving them or you're accepting that apology. It's kind of, it's the closure to that conversation that you're having. All right, so the next part is to communicate clearly. And um, we've talked about this in a session one. And remember our acronym of TALK. So tune into your child, address the situation together, listen with understanding and keeping your cool. So remembering with the T, the tune in, um, that we are getting rid of distractions, we're pausing life to face each other and have those respectful conversations. Um, it's really hard to talk to somebody when you're staring at the top of their head because they're on their phone. So making sure that we are pausing life, we're putting all of our screens away, we're um, you know, making sure that it's just the two of us or whoever is involved in that situation and we're completely tuning in to each other. Um, and this is an essential ingredient in those game day confrontations. So, you know, when we're in the heat of the game day, making sure that we are being really conscious to tune in to each other. Then we're going to address the situation together, whether it's a conflict or a correction. Um, you want to make sure that you include your child as you talk about the situation. Um, when you talk to your child about what was wrong with their words or actions, or even why it was wrong. Um, this is not the time to lecture or to rant. So um, this is kind of similar to the apology. We're gonna say what and how. Um, so um, really the addressing the situation together, um, we're gonna talk about the why and the how. So this is really when it's really important to look at what right looks like. So modeling that good behavior, talking about our values. Um, this is why what you said or did does not match up with our family values, our family game plan, why that doesn't match up together. So it's great if you're in the pregame or the postgame and you can really talk through these things in length. If you are in the, the game day situation, it's going to be more quick spurts. I need your immediate attention. Um, that was not okay. And then you can do a post game wrap up later when it, the situation's calmed down and everybody's calmed down a little bit. All right, so the L is for listen with understanding. There are expectations and rules that you need to reconsider at times. And so making sure that we are listening with understanding with our children, especially if they get older, as they get older, 
you know, our kids may have explanations or um, excuses for what or why of their actions and genuinely listening and restating these views, it doesn't um, weaken our authority as a parent. It's actually strengthening our parent-child relationship when we truly listen to them. Because there are times in um, our lives when, you know, we do need to loosen up a little bit. Our children are going to come to us with very legitimate reasons why they want to change a rule. They want to change an expo um, expectation. They want to maybe extend curfew a little bit. So making sure that we are uh, listening with understanding and really trying to listen to what they say. So that is why we have two ears and one mouth. So we need to make sure that we're listening twice as much as we're speaking and listening truly for the meaning. So um, if the situation is a conflict over rules or expectations, then try to look at how your kid's perspective relates to your family rules and values. So, um, you know, making sure one of the examples that I thought of was my son wanted to have his curfew extended after prom. So, you know, I kind of had to look at our family values. Um, I had to look at the safety of the situation. Where were they going to be? What was going to be happening? Um, so if all of those things get answered, then yeah, maybe prom night is a night to extend curfew a little bit, but let's talk about where you're going to be, what's going to be happening, who's going to be driving, those kinds of things. So you're kind of finding that uh, middle ground in there, but not changing your values, um, but listening to our children with understanding of what's going on. All right, and then the last one is to keep your cool. So remember that the last thing an out of control child needs is an out of control adult. So remembering that our children, we always have at least one, who's a lot like us usually and knows exactly what buttons to push. Uh, they're the ones that, that um, you know, kind of need a little bit more and start those conflicts a little bit. But we need to make sure that we're remembering to master our own emotions, our own reactions, um, because we're modeling how to have conflict. Uh, we want our children to grow up and be able to have healthy conflicts throughout their life. And they get that from learning from us. So making sure we're modeling those, um, keeping calm, keeping cool, whatever you need to do. If you need to take a time out, if you need to take a 10 minute break, if you need to do your deep breathing exercises, um, I have one child that really pushes my buttons, and so we have to do our deep breathing exercises. Uh, sometimes that helps us deal with everything and just calm down. All right, so um, we're going to talk, kind of switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about a game day strategy number one. This is three strikes and you're out. So game day basically refers to those times when you as the parent or coach need to deal with your child testing the limits, disobeying, or engaging in some activity that is contra um, contrary to your family's values. So it's almost always a time when you need your child to respond to you immediately. So remember, this is in the, the middle of a game. Um, this is in the heat of an argument, the heat of a situation that's going on. So all of our long talks and conversations happen in pre-game and post-game. So these are more quick, not much long explanation involved, not much discussion. I just need your immediate attention. This is game day. So um, sometimes you can give a warning or two, um, but sometimes we need their immediate cooperation. Like Sarah talked about, I don't want you running in the street. That's not safe. I need your immediate attention on me. So a lot of this depends on your parental style um, and how many times you need to have that immediate cooperation. Um, so regardless of your style, we need to make sure that these game days are brief and to the point. So this is an example from professional sports. Um, if anybody watches NBA basketball, um, so a lot of times they'll have the huddle and they'll have the coach mic'd. So in that, the coach is often saying things, there, there lots of passion, no hesitation when you have an open shot. You take the open shot. Let's win this defensively. You need to keep passing and sharing the ball. Keep your energy up. You own these boards. Every missed shot is your ball. So when we're at home and we're listening to that and we think, 
these coaches make millions of dollars for this. What, what are they even saying? I don't, you know, these little short snippets of information. But what we have to realize is that coach has spent a lot of quality time with those players. During this game time, he just needs their immediate attention. He's going to give them those little snippets of information. But those players who have spent hours and hours with him know exactly what he's talking about. So it's the same as parents. We have spent a lot of time with our kids. We have given them all those wonderful, positive family values, family time and talks. So during this game day, these are short snippets of information that you're going to be uh, given during the game. So strike one, um, so you can give a warning, but you got to be cautious with the warnings. Um, if you've ever been out at a store and you hear the parents say, I'm not going to tell you again, this is your last warning, I'm not going to tell you again, and they do it 15 times and the kid keeps running around and doing the same thing. So these three strikes are really important that we stick to them. So the first one is our warning. Strike two is where we define the consequences. If I have to tell you again, we're leaving. If I have to tell you again, then you're gonna sit out for 10 minutes. What, whatever that consequence is, you've already established that in your pregame. And then strike three is you give the consequence. There's no discussion. Um, there's no negotiation at that point. They have had their warning. They've had the, defined the consequence. And then now they have to um, deal with whatever the consequence is. All right, and making sure that we stick to it as parents. All right, so the last part is going to be shaping the consequence. So another helpful approach for parents is to determine the format to follow when having to confront your child when they are um, acting inappropriately or disobediently. So this strategy is called shaping the consequence because what we want ultimately is um, our child to think through things and like Lisa said, be good humans. Like when they grow up, we want them to know right from wrong, to be able to make these decisions on their own. Um, so thinking through um, what was it that you did that was wrong? What was wrong about this situation? So um, what is it that you did that was wrong? Helping them think through that. What was the consequence that we talked about if you did this behavior? Is there anything you want to say or tell me about what you did? So this allows your child to give an explanation or an apology. Um, this is why I did it, or, you know, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. It just gives your child a chance to actually say something or, or defend themselves. And then um, what will you do so differently next time? And then um, step five is really important, and that is always ending with love. Um, so there are times when um, that discussion trails off without a clear ending. We are left feeling as parents like, oh my gosh, you know, I feel like I'm always the heavy and the, you know, I always have to come down on them so hard and our kids feel deflated and, and everything. If you let it end that way, that's a really hard way to end. Um, discipline, the root word of discipline is to disciple and it means teaching. So we wanna make sure that we're teaching our children through all of these experiences. So we always need to make sure that we end with love. We end with um, summarizing what you discuss, agreed upon our uh, transition, you know, into the next topic. We're gonna move on from this and end with, I want you to know that I love you. I hope you're able to handle this situation better next time. And then we're gonna have some type of appropriate display of affection. We're gonna hug, put a hand on the shoulder, a hand on the back. We're gonna hug them and say, I love you. I didn't like what you did. That was a behavior, but I love you as a person always. All right, now we're gonna move on to Karen. All right, we're going to talk about, uh, can you walk the talk? And so this is a time to think about a time when you had a situation with a child and it involves some discipline and maybe some conflict over an area. And so we want to remember what our parents as parents, what our expectations are, assignments or rules, and then also think about uh, your game day situation, what actually happened, and then how you followed up with it. 
So keep in mind the benchmarks of the talk, the meaningful apology format and any of the game day coaching strategies that fit your situation. All right. So remember that consistency is very important in almost every area of parenting, but especially in the area of how you handle discipline in ish, issues. And the stronger the will or your child, the more crucial your consistency becomes. This is because stronger-willed children challenge almost everything constantly so that you can easily become worn out by trying to stay consistent. But once they see you break down and become lax in enforcing some areas of the ears, then they seem to immediately up their game and expect this bending boundary every time. For instance, if you tell your preschooler it is time to come in and get ready for bed. This doesn't just apply to preschoolers. This applies to seven and 10 year old boys. I have this problem like very, very often. And your child says, okay, but I just wanna go down the slide one more time. So you say that is fine, but then you need to come in. Then your child goes down the slide and immediately runs back to the ladder to go down a second time. And while you are watching in your face. Now you would think that it is a no brainer to stop your child and make them go in the house to get ready for bed. But if you are like many parents, by the end of the day, you are worn out. And it can be easier to just look the other way and let it go. But I can guarantee you that once you let it go, then your child will up their game and try to get just one more out of you every single time. So it is actually easier in the long run to quickly stop your child, deal with their reaction, but require the one more time to be the real only one more time. As was said in the comparison of a coach during the game, during an intervention, few words are needed and usually more are usually more effective. Power struggles become a, between a child and a parent tend to feed on lots of talking. So it's better to keep your words at a minimum. In fact, you have multiple, if you have multiple interventions like the three strikes approach, then it is a rule of them that you should use fewer words with each intervention. So to go back to the preschooler wanting to go down the slide one more time before bed, you might explain a bit when first asked. Yes, you can go down one more time, but after that, I want you to come in the house and get ready for bed. Do you understand me? Just one more time and then come in, okay? And make sure your child says, okay. But then after coming down the slide, your child runs back to the ladder, you would say something like, I said one more time, come in the house now. Fewer words with the second intervention. If your child argues, your number of words will decrease even more. House, now. More, it seems like interventions by their nature are always very negative and restricting and upsetting, but there are ways to intervene with encouragement. First, whenever your child follows through on something you ask, then be sure to acknowledge it with an encouragement and praise. To use the coach's example during the game, you will see coaches encouraging much more than confronting. They even clap at some mistakes as if to say, that's okay, keep on trying. They are good role models for parents to follow in the ways they encourage their children, even in the heat of the moment. Second, when you have to reinforce a rule or expectation, like in the bedtime example of the preschooler, then an encouraging redirect can be added to your intervention. You can go down the slide one more time before bed and then come in. And remember that we will be picking some bedtime books to read as soon as you get in here. As mentioned earlier, under staying consistent, the stronger your child's will, the more often your head-on parenting approach turns into a major drama. So a few positive and encouraging redirects during your intervention and confrontations can greatly increase your child's cooperation while decreasing the tantrums and the drama. There is always a balance between staying in tune with your kids and over involvement. involvement. The term helicopter parenting came about in the 1980s for the parents that hover over their kids. A classic example of this with college age kids was found in the universities that established an office to handle parent complaints about the grades that some professors gave one of their kids. This parental interference was more normal in 
elementary and even junior high school, but not until the early 2000s did it become so prevalent with 20 something kids that universities had to assign an office to handle the calls. On the other hand, we have also seen the kids who publicly are acting up and their parent is oblivious while absorbed on their smartphone. And know that the balance between managing your child and allowing your child to have autonomy and freedom keeps shifting with each passing year and sometimes month. So make periodic and necessary adjustments. There are many ways to stay in charge. One important way is to use eye contact and proximity with your child. When you talk to your child without their full attention, then your authority is minimized. Make a pres practice of having your child look at you rather than an iPad, a TV, a phone, or toys, or letting them play with their Legos while you're talking to them. But this also means that you do you too must make a practice of looking at your child when you listen, so don't continue to cook supper while they want to talk to you. Another simple way to maintain authority is by paying attention to the distance between you and your child. For instance, for instance closing the distance, kneeling down to be face to face, gently touching your child, or even just taking a couple steps towards your child will naturally increase the force of what you're trying to say to your child. Often you can speak quieter, but with greater impact when you have closed the distance between you and your child. This was keeping your cool. This was emphasized in the self-regulatory skill of stop, breathe, think, speak. There are numerous benefits to mastering your emotions and reactions. First, you will handle more situations with fewer regrets. Second, you will model what you are attempting to develop in your kids. And finally, you will lessen the risk of being manipulated by your kids. In other words, kids often consciously and unconsciously play on a parent's emotion. So when parents are able to keep a reasonable control over their own emotions, then they remove that control from their kids. Okay, we're gonna wrap up today as we have learned a lot of things and strategies that we can use. You have learned that you're going to need to build a positive trust between you and your children that involves respect and a positive attitude. We call this positive trust attitudes building sportsmanship. A three-step game plan is to build the sportsmanship between you and your children was described. In step one of your game plan, you identified the core values that you want to practice and instill in your children. We all have these expectations when we're thinking about being a mother or a father someday, but when it really gets here and we get into the emotions, a lot goes awry. In step two, you worked on creating a positive structure in your relationship with your children by clarifying four areas. Your expectations, your assignment or job, your rules and skills that you want your children to develop. It was suggested that you can use the pregame, the game day, and the postgame fr framework to think about how and when you talk to your children about the four areas. I have three sons and I have eight grandkids. I can guarantee you if I was writing a plan, then I would come up with 11 different plans. Do not plan on one plan fits all because it's not going to happen. And the third and last step of your game is to plan to plan was to practice some key strategies relating to your children. So what I want you to do is think about your relationship with each of your children. Identify the basis you feel like they are on in this area of team sportsmanship. Some are almost to the third base. Some of them are still striking out time after time. Have them identify something that you can do with each child to help them move to the next base. What is something you can promise them to get them to move forward to the next base? This is an important area for building and maintaining trust, love and respect for each other. And when I think about thinking about something that would help them, uh, I hope you have as a parent read the five love languages if, you not, if not, let me highly encourage that book because what's in a reward to one child means nothing to the other. So search out for each of your children's love languages and give a reward in that area. 
Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah to wind us up. Thank you, Sarah. It's great when two Sarahs go back to back. Easy to remember our names. Hope that everyone enjoyed today's session. I know I took a lot of notes down. Um, this is an awesome research-based program. These tips and strategies are not our opinion as parents and grandparents, but hopefully when you have all five sessions under your belt, you've learned a lot and you have a great family parent playbook where you can really work on that family, that team unit, whatever it looks like to just function well and to everyone have stronger bonds. This is a daily practice. We're always doing the pregame, game day, postgame all day long, but it really helps your team, your family unit to have stronger bonds to be strengthened. And today's session about trust and respect is, you know, so valuable. I want that in my family. So I hope that you want that in your family too. And you'll take from today and make some goals for yourself as a parent and with your children and just keep working towards hitting those home runs within your, within your home and family. So I've really enjoyed today. I thank you all for coming. I thank you all for sharing as educators today, but have a great day.